Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Choose Strong Podcast. I'm your host, Sally McRae. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very happy that you are here. I hope that your day is getting off to a great start if it's the beginning of your day. Um, If it's the end of your day, thank you for ending your day with me. No matter where you are, if you're riding in your uh, your car, if you're in the kitchen making a cup of coffee, which is my favorite thing to do, you're at the gym, you're out for a run, you're on your bike, um, I'm so happy that you decided to push play on this podcast because every download uh, matters to us. Um, every listen, uh, all of our followers, every review, we read every single one. Uh, this really is what fuels us and help helps us to keep on going. Uh, Eddie will be joining me for the next podcast. So today I am solo and the title of our podcast is The Mental Game. And this is just part one. So I'm going to do a a couple episodes on this. One of the reasons why it's going to be multiple episodes is because it is easily one of the most uh, questioned, um, messaged, uh, I would say one of the biggest inquiries that I have gotten in my career. And I love talking about mental strength. I love talking about just the mental game um, as it pertains to all aspects of life. And so my hope today for you is that you'll be able to take something away from this podcast and implement it into your life. And if anything, um, I hope to give you something to think about. I hope that you feel encouraged. I hope that you feel strengthened. Overall, that's always my goal whenever you decide to uh, sit and listen to one of these podcasts. Before I dive in, I do want to just give a shout out to everyone who has been uh, supporting us through either the app, um, or my book, choose strong. I just want to say thank you so much. And, um, I will be including links in the episode notes. If you are interested in run in strength programs or how I train, I have hundreds of customized, um, workouts made by yours truly, um, that are in the app and I add new stuff every week. So please go check that out. Um, we are expanding, adding more race programs. I know a lot of people have been asking about that. I have been hard at work working on different distances um, for different race programs for you. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then as far as the book goes, I just need to pause here for a second and say thank you so much for the tidal wave of messages, comments, and kindness um, that I've gotten in response to my book. And um, I'll tell you what, it, it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to write. It was um, a very long journey for me, but I really appreciate those who have taken the time to reach out, um, to leave kind reviews. Um, It really means a lot. If you've read my book and you've reached out, if you have a spare moment to leave an Amazon review or a Goodreads review, um, if it's favorable... (laughs) If you have complaints, you can send those directly to me, (laughs) but, um, it does help the book and, um, it definitely helps me out. So, um, I really appreciate it and yeah, we'll, we, I will put the links for both of those things in the show notes, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, on this episode, as I said before, the mental game is one of the most, uh, questioned, uh, topics of my career. And, um, and I think it's twofold on, on one hand, uh, it, I really like talking about it as it relates to life. There have been a lot of things that I have gone through, especially if you if you've read the first part of my memoir series, um, where my mind, as I knew it, starting at a young age, is a very powerful tool, and I think it's a common topic now too. We understand that, you know, many times what your mind believes, the body achieves. Uh, we also understand from personal experience. I'm sure you can relate to this in some way or another, that when our mind is not in a good place, if we're going through a really tough storm in life, or even if you're just in the middle of, of a run or in a race and, and you start to kind of, kind of sink down into that dark patch where you're, you're either beating yourself up or you just don't see how you can keep going. Um, or you're just not feeling it. You understand how powerful your mind can be 
in dictating your decisions in dictating whether or not uh, you believe in yourself. It, our minds, uh, many times when we look in the mirror can be our biggest enemy. Uh, sometimes our minds will play tricks on us and, and make us think that we are not attractive or valuable or worthwhile or capable. I mean, all these things that many times start in our own minds. And so I really love talking about this topic because I love to flip it around and just encourage other people. So whether you're working toward a goal in your everyday life, in a relationship, um, or in, in fitness and sport, I really think that you're going to get something from today's topic. Uh, if you read my book, I actually opened with a, a few notes about this in, in the prologue, and I do touch on the power of the mind as it pertains to our choices. And you have a choice every single day to wake up and have a good day, um, to be happy, to be strong. All those things are choices. And I really do um, speak even in the wake of, of hard times and sadness. Um, and I'm not talking about something that's fake. And I, I actually do like to differentiate the difference between happiness and joy, because I believe that joy is a strength. I believe that Joy is something that we can have even when our world is is falling apart. And joy is is rooted very deeply in in gratitude and hope. Uh, someone who is is thankful and full of hope, joy just exudes out of out of them. And that's something that you can choose every day. One of the things that, um, and I'll touch just one more time on my book. One of the things I really wanted to highlight and why I made the book two parts is that because it chronicles 18 years, um, the time frame is really powerful because so often I talk with people who are in a tough period in their life or in a tough season, or they talk about a really tough patch in a race. And the discussion often comes down to, I don't know how much more I, I could take. This has been going on for so long, or this has been the pattern for so long. And I really understand that deeply in my core. Um, if you'll read my book, it really was from start to finish, just trial after trial, after struggle, after challenge. I mean, it was nonstop and I'm not saying that, that it has stopped, but I really do understand those long seasons and many time it is the wearing down. It is the fatigue. It is losing hope when things are strung out for so long, or we just feel like, wow, I have failed in this area over and over again. This just isn't for me, or maybe I'm not capable. Um, but one of the things that is so important to understand is that many times if we keep on doing and responding and acting in the same way, we are going to get the same outcome. And when I talk about responses, I'm talking about how you talk to yourself. You know, your brain is so powerful. If you hit a rough patch, are you one that immediately beats yourself up? Are you one who is actually your worst critic? And so what happens is you fall into these patterns and when things are hard or challenging, it's the negative self-talk. And then the outcome is almost inevitable. The outcome is something that is disappointing. The outcomes might be a, a place where you come to quitting or giving up um, or never trying something again. And so I had people write in, um, a couple weeks ago. And, um, I said, you know, send me your questions. I picked out the ones that, that pertain to this, uh, this mental game and they are, uh, kind of all over the place as, as far as the topic goes, but I am going to be coming back to the same message. I chose these five questions because I feel like that whether you are a teenager in high school listening to this podcast, um, or you're for, if you're a grandma rocking your baby to sleep, your granddaughter to sleep, um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to get something out of this. You're going to be able to relate to this as, as these really, um, are the seasons in life for all of us, for all humans. Every day we wake up, um, the voice in our head is often what goes off first. And it's, it's those thoughts that no one else can hear except you. And so let's go ahead and, and tackle them. Um, the first question uh, comes in from um, somebody talking about a race. So I'm going to start at, at really the most uh, superficial layer here, because in my mind, races are great opportunities to challenge ourselves. They are structured 
um, they, they are structured situations, right? I, I think we can all agree that the hardest things in life don't come in a race. They are the, the surprises, the tragedies, the setbacks, the things that we didn't see coming um, that really impact our life in, in great ways. And so I wanted to start off with talking about a race because um, many of us can, can relate to this, but I know for myself, I have been in uh, very, very many rough moments in a race. And I think that I do have a lot of listeners who like to compete. And so um, let's go ahead and start here. Can you talk about how you get through hard moments in a race? Now, there's a saying that says how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so um, that is why the themes today are you're going to find are going to be very similar because how I um, get through challenges in a race are also how I get through challenges in life. Obviously, the variables, the details of of what is actually going on um, are going to be different. But I'm going to touch back on Coca Dona 250 to help illustrate this, and I think this is a great way to illustrate it because there's actually a film about my race that I did on May 1st, uh, just this past May. It's called Every Step Forward. You can check it out on my YouTube channel. Um, the response to that video that Drew Darby and Tyler McCain uh, made has been phenomenal, but there was definitely a very strong message that I wanted to send within that. Now, I was not planning on having the day that I had. I would say it was probably the most painful race of my life and not because uh, my legs were tired or it was it felt too hard. It really came down to um, just acute physical pain that I chose chose to push through because in my mind, it was worth it. It was a race that I had trained for very hard. I dedicated um, about six months to it. And I really wanted to learn about the 200 mile distance. This was my first time doing a 200. Uh, the goal was to um, run conservatively as a way to train myself to be patient, to learn, to listen. And then maybe at a mile 150, um, if I was feeling good, I, I would start racing. So that was the goal going in to this race. And um, if you're not familiar with Coconut 250, again, you can check out the film, but in short, it's a race that starts, it's a point to point 250 mile race in Arizona. It starts in Phoenix and goes all the way to Flagstaff. So you're passing through places like Prescott and Sedona and Jerome. It's absolutely beautiful. And you get everything from, um, this really intense, fully exposed heat. You then also get altitude. You're up in, um, pine trees. Uh, you're running through canyons, lots of rocks through neighborhoods, roads, um, trails all over. It's, it really is an adventure. Now, in my mind, I knew that I was very fit. I really believed that I could go the distance. I believed with my experience, you know, 10 plus years as an ultra marathoner, I uh, wasn't so, so much intimidated by the distance, but rather what was going to be happening to me, happening to me once I surpassed, uh, the 135 mile mark, which that's the furthest I've ever gone in my life. So I was going to be running 115 more miles than I was used to. By mile seven, I knew that uh, there was a problem. And um, I had worn a pair of socks that were not washed and I could feel my foot sliding all around in my shoes, um, in a pair of shoes that I've worn for a decade, the Nike Wild Horse. And so I had concluded that the oils on this sock, um, it was a colorful printed thick sock and I know better. I always wash my stuff and, um, but I thought, wow, I, I made a mistake uh, and I think one of the most powerful things you can do in a hard moment in a, in a race is first take responsibility. When we take responsibility, it allows us a little bit more control over what we do next. And I know that at the end of the day, for many of us, sometimes we make bad decisions because we feel like we are out of control and we're kind of like grasping at the wind, trying to control something that we can't. But one thing you can control is whether or not you take respons responsibility. Now, I took responsibility right then and there. I, and I told myself, I'm not going to not finish this race 
because of a mistake that I made. That can't be the excuse. I don't want that as my excuse. I trained too hard. Now, mind you, this is by mile seven. I think it's even earlier in that. I knew it was pretty bad early on. But the way that I talked to myself, um, it immediately when I knew something was wrong is something that I've had to coach and train myself. It has taken me years to get there. And so I, I think it's really important that I communicate that to you because sometimes when, when people, um, hear me talk on this subject, they might say something like, well, that's, you know, you make it sound so easy or yeah, easier said than done. I get that 100%. I get that when we are trying to teach ourselves something new, when we're trying to change a habit, when we are trying to um, understand and see a new perspective, none of those things come instantly. It takes repetition, it takes time, and it takes patience and grace, that patience and grace that you need to give yourself. And so talking to myself um, with a strong and more positive, hopeful mindset, a mindset of gratitude. I, I get to be out here. So let's just do the best that we can. That's taken me time. And so you can practice that in the little things in your life. And I think that it's, it's really easy, especially when we are in situations where we feel like this was actually someone else's fault. Um, and I'll give an example of that too. Um, I raced in the Gobi desert in China back in 2016 and I got lost twice. Um, I really wanted to win that race. Um, me and my good friend, Lucy Bartholomew were racing it together and we were, um, racing up front together. Just, it was only like the first like mile or mile and a half, but we had to kind of go around all these gigantic rocks and, um, somehow or another, I took the wrong way with, with a pack of guys. So I went left and another group went right. And I ran out, I would say for like almost a mile when all of us realized we were actually running back. Once the clearing opened up, we were running back towards the start line. We could see the start line in the distance. It was terrible. It was like, where are we going? So we turn around, we make our way back. So now we've added on this distance. We've added on this time. I've fallen off the front pack. I then run about five or six more miles and I get to the first aid station now the aid station right next to it was this long, wide fire road that ran straight to the mountains. And I knew that we were running straight to the mountains. I knew that we were going to be traversing this area. When I got to the aid station, a volunteer pointed me down that road. I got what I needed and there was a language barrier. They, everyone at the race spoke Chinese. Uh, very few people I could find could speak English, but they, they pointed and as best they could, you know, head down there. Now, this is an open fire road. I wanted to catch back up to the front pack, so I took off. I mean, I was hammering down this road. It was smooth. Um, I'm staring at the mountains. I was stoked. After almost a mile, a truck comes riding up next to me, and this guy is hollering at me in, in Chinese, and he keeps pointing back, pointing across this massive field off to my left. And I'm looking at him like, what is this guy talking about? Because there's a couple other runners with me too. I wasn't the only one that had gone down this road. And I ignore him. I'm like, I don't, maybe this guy's like a local. I mean, how can you really be a local in the Gobi Desert? We were literally in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so at first I just thought like, does this guy live out here? Is he with the race? I kept running, but he stayed with me and he keeps hollering at me again. And he points, keeps pointing out. And I look and I see a big group of people. And I realize that I'm running on the wrong course. So I yell out to the other runners around me and I say, we have to go all the way back. So I have to run all the way back to the aid station and now go in the opposite direction across this other field. It was really easy for me at that time. Um, I ended up in, in second place, but I, I was upset. You know, it was really easy for me to want to put the blame on the volunteer. Um, you know, I, I thought I was going in, in the right direction. I was trying my best. I was following all the markers and to have the volunteers then point me in the wrong direction. I thought that was their fault. Now there's, there's two things that happen here. Um, I can rest on, on blaming them, but what good does that do? 
how is that going to help me move forward? If I just continue on in the race now and I'm disgruntled and I'm angry because I've lost all this time, I've run extra miles. Um, I flew all the way on the other side of the world to run well, and now I'm not, and, um, I'm not at the pace that I want to be. I could have a long list of all the things that, that happened to me and, um, and, and these people to blame. What kind of race experience am I going to have now? If, if I take that stance, what kind of perspective? Um, and I'll, I'll tell you in this race, I, I did choose to change my perspective. And I think it's important to know too, like I'm human. I did have a couple of minutes where I was really mad and I think that's okay. Um, I keep it to myself, of course, in my mind, but then I really start to step back from the situation mentally. And the way that I did that was I had to get out of myself. And I think this is one of the key things, um, that if, if you want to write this down, you can, but sometimes you have to step out of the situation mentally and look at it from the outside. You need to take on a different perspective and almost look at it, uh, from a bystander's point of view. And this has helped me over and over and over again. When you are so deep in disappointment, it's very easy to turn inward and think about all the bad things that are happening to you and, um, and then start asking yourself negative questions. Why does this have to, have to happen to me? Why did it have to be today? Uh, it's really easy to then spiral. The reality is that the outcome of that mindset, it never gets you to where you need to go. That doesn't make you stronger. It doesn't help you overcome. It doesn't help you to keep moving forward. And I'll tell you what, it really makes you an unpleasant person to be around. So for me, I knew in that moment, I need to step away from how I'm feeling and how angry I am in this moment. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to look around at where I am. I am in the freaking Gobi desert in China. <laughs> I was flown out here. It took two plane rides, two bus rides. It took two and a half days to get out there of travel. And we were dropped off in the middle of nowhere, but in the middle of nowhere, they had built this huge festival. There were entertainers and, and people that were dancing and playing instruments and there was food and there was all these, these tents where you could relax. And afterward, I mean, our trophies were massive and there was, uh, there was a prize purse. I mean, it really was an incredible event. And as I was running along, making my way along the course, I asked myself, do you think you're ever going to run here again? Look around, Sally. You're racing in the Gobi Desert. And yeah, you know what? A volunteer told you to go the wrong way. You also went the wrong way at the beginning. There was a lot of confusion. You're behind. You're not the pace that you want to be. But man, there's so many more miles to run and we get to enjoy every step of this. We get to go make a memory. We get to make an adventure out of it. Uh, the second thing I, I want to say as it pertains to a race is when you are in a really rough spot. This is one of the simplest things that you can do, but ask yourself, what is the story that I want to tell tomorrow? So no matter how, uh, you know, maybe if you're just in this funk and you have, your legs have blown up, you don't know if you're going to make that aid station cut off. Um, or maybe, you know, you're not going to make it. Whatever it is, you could be dead last, or maybe you're racing for the podium and you just miss it. You come in fourth place. I think what's important is to really keep that mindset of, I want to tell a good story. I, and you're in control of that. You are in control of the story that you want to tell. And so in hard moments in a race, those are two really powerful things. I have a lot more. I mean, there's a lot of things, but those are two things that, um, I go to, I need to get out of the, my head, out of the situation, look at this from a different perspective. Let's dig through all the good and all the joy about being out here. And what's the stronger mindset that I can have? Well, I'm still going to give my best. I'm still going to move forward and I am going to go and write a great story. My second question comes in, um, it's kind of a two part. It looks like a two part. So I'm gonna go ahead and read it. What are your positive self-talk phrases on tough days? What do you say to yourself? 
Now this can be twofold. So this can go life, this can go race. And I just got done talking about racing. So I am going to tackle life here. Um, my next question does as well. And so the positive self-talk phrases that I tell myself, one of the most powerful ones is remember who you are. This is something that you can tell yourself when you wake up in the morning, when you look at yourself in the, in the mirror, because the truth is there's one you. And if you look in the mirror and you are one that is negative, this is going to be a really tough day. Oh my gosh, why do I look like this? Um, or, or you talk about what you're feeling as far as I don't feel weak. I don't feel great. I don't know if I'm capable. Remember that the person that you are and the things that you tell yourself over and over again, they're very powerful. And there are so many wonderful things about who you are. You would be doing yourself so much better and so much value if you actually took the time to write down 10 things that are great about you. Now, this is actually an exercise that's very difficult for people to do because they feel like, oh, I don't want to be bragging. I don't want to boast. But you know what? Open up a journal open up, um, you know, grab a scrap piece of paper. Can you write down 10 things that are great about who you are? I really hope uh, that you can see those great things about you, the things that make you unique. And I think that this is a great way to start off your day is remembering who you are and all the unique things that, that make your life, um, unique and make you unique. And not only in as an individual, but how you relate to the world uh, in your relationships, in your career, in, in your sport. Uh, there's one you. And it's important that you remember that day in and day out. On tough days, what do you say to yourself? So this is the the second part. You know, I've had a lot of tough days in my life. I've had um, some, even some races that have, you know, gotten me really down for weeks after I have a bad race or, um, you know, whether it's things in extended family or um, in my career, I've definitely had some really tough days where um, I haven't, been able to, to speak positively to myself. And like I said at the beginning, um, this is a journey that I think um, has taken me a long time. And I think that's normal for all people because on tough days, um, one of the things that I've realized is it's really easy to feel weak when things are going wrong and then to settle back into a bad habit. And sometimes that bad habit is being negative or just telling yourself, I'm just going to sit on the couch or I'm just going to lay in bed and I'm not going to go outside. One of the activities I do on a tough days is I just get outside. And I know not everyone lives in an area where there's sunshine all the time, but I think even outside of sunshine, fresh air is so powerful. Um, I like to go down to the beach um, or on a trail when I am having a tough day, I get outside because two things usually happen. One, I, I get distracted. I get distracted by the sunshine, by the breeze in my face, by the trees, um, flowers, people walking their dog. And I usually also encounter people. And I think one of the most powerful things we can do when we are feeling down, we're having that tough day is to connect with people. Even if it's a stranger, it's amazing how saying good morning to someone or how you doing um, in your neighborhood or when you're out and about how that can change your day. And you never know, uh, or if you meet up with a friend for coffee, how that conversation can totally lift your spirits. And so I think it's really important that we understand that real human life experiences and connections are far more powerful than um, scrolling through Instagram, than watching YouTube. I think that if anything, this is why sometimes our days can feel tougher. We start comparing ourselves. Um, we are sedentary. We're not getting that fresh air. We're not really involving ourselves in real life. And so I just want to encourage you, remember who you are and get outside, connect with people, connect with real life. Remember too, that tough days do not last forever. And that's something else that I tell myself. Sometimes it is, I, I need to get through this day and I need to get through it as best I can. And 
you know, not all situations change overnight. You know, sometimes you're going to have a tough week. You're going to have a tough month. You're going to have a tough semester. And you do have to get to a point where you ask yourself, who am I when everything falls apart? Who am I when I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? And and what am I going to do about that? Are you going to keep on staying in that darkness? Or are you going to find a way to actually increase in strength in spite of it all? I'll tell you what, some of my toughest days and the most challenging moments in my life are where I have grown in strength the most because I chose to. And I think that's something that we can all choose. We can choose to take the higher road. We can choose to have the hard conversation. We can choose to have a heart of gratitude. Uh, There's a lot of choices that we can make. And I think that choosing the strongest in every situation in life is your best bet. It's not the easiest and it does take practice, but those tough days that you have, we all have them. It's very much a part of life, just as much as the, um, the summit experiences or the good days or the days that are filled with joy, you will have tough days and it's important to have a plan and to remember who you are and, and how it is that you want to talk to yourself on those days. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to add a little, a little piece here because I know in my youth, one of the things that I always felt was that my life was actually made for setbacks and negativity. Um, I went through many seasons where I just felt like, well, my life just stinks And of course it does, because look back on all these years, all this hurt, all these challenges. And I really would compare myself to people around me. I compare myself to other kids at school who had loving families and really supportive um, communities all around them. I compared myself to just material possessions. We'll look at everything they have and look at their nice house and their nice car and shoes and clothes and, you know, look what I have. And I think it's really easy to kind of fall into this spiral and just beat ourselves up that when a lot of negativity or challenges or setbacks where we don't have what everyone else has, that we just think, well, this is just my life. And I want to encourage you that you get to choose the life that you want. And it does take work. It does take time. It doesn't change overnight. But I'll tell you, that work is worth it. And that work that you do, not only on on your mindset, but even just the work of your hands, what it takes to build something up, what it takes to get out of a a certain situation. You know, I I share this in my book that I started working really young. And in my mind, I like started to understand if I was going to change my life, I was responsible for it. I had to change it. No one went to college in my family. I knew I had to work in order to get to get to college. We didn't have a lot of money growing up and there was a lot of pain that was associated with that right down to not having health care. And, um, you know, my, both my parents, because they didn't have health care, suffered greatly. Uh, you know, they said that my mom probably would have been saved if she would have been going to the doctor. They could have um, tackled her cancer so much earlier. And, um, and so it's easy to look back on my life and think, wow, all these negative things, um, that's just signature to my life. That's just who I am. At, at some point in my life, I had to say, this isn't the life that I want. And I don't believe that this is the life that's ahead for me. And this is just a tough season. This is a tough event. This is a tough situation, but it's not my forever. And it's not how the story is going to end. And I think today I am a testament of that. The The choices that I've made in my life, and I'm not going to say that they've all been perfect or they've all been great. I've made a lot of really bad choices in my life, but I think that choosing to move forward, regardless of what the season, regardless if the choice was good, was good or bad, is something that I will always keep doing. I always want to keep reaching for a better day. I always want to keep reaching for um, for the best. The best is yet, yet to come. I, I love that saying because I really do believe that's true. And I believe that for you too. Um, advice for those of us experiencing injury or body changes. Now, this was a really powerful question because I think that our physical body 
um, has a lot to do with how we even approach life on a daily basis. So for those of you that have been injured before, I know I have, uh, when you have injury, it's really easy to start your day. You wake up and you're like, oh yeah, I have a broken arm. Oh shoot. I, I'm in a cast. I twisted my ankle or I can't run or I can't go lift or I'm hobbling, I'm limping like, or I have, I've had this, um, this illness for the last two weeks. When we focus on the injury, when we focus on how we're feeling, oh goodness, it's so easy to start our day off on the wrong foot. And, and to be very negative. And so like injury, like body changes, yeah, these are very real, um, very common seasons in our life. I've, I've experienced both injury and massive body changes. Um, I, was, I was pregnant twice. I've had three surgeries on my stomach. Um, and, you know, I have the scars that are, that are permanent to, to show that. I'd say the, the biggest body changes I had were you know, gaining a lot of weight with both my kids. With Mackenzie, I gained almost 60 pounds and I think 40 with Isaiah. I gained a lot of weight. I loved to eat when I was pregnant and I really didn't care how much I was eating. I actually had a doctor call me out on it. He's, he, um, I can laugh about it now. I was not laughing when, <laughs> when I was in the doctor office, but he said, you're eating for you and a little baby, not two adults. <laughs> I had gained so much weight so fast with me, with Mackenzie. And so, um, yeah, talk about body changes. I went from at this time I was doing some road marathons and I was a trainer and, you know, I was still lifting, but the body changes that, that happen with, um, you know, a growing belly. And then after, uh, having, you know, I had emergency C-section. So it was, uh, both of those were pretty traumatic situations for me. And, you know, I'm holding a baby and I'm healing from stomach surgery. And then I've got all this extra weight. Did that take a toll on me mentally? 100%. I mean, even if, you know, if, if we're talking about men here and, you know, you're not, you're not giving birth to babies, even if we're talking about men, when we have big changes, whether it's putting on a lot of weight or, you know, you're getting knee surgery. I mean, it just changes how you feel, how you operate, how you move in the world. Um, it changes how, what clothes you, you choose, what ex activities you do. That's really difficult. And one of the things that has always helped me is that I, I, one, I can be in control of my reactions to all of those things. Um, two, my body is, is not the best thing about who I am as a person. And that is a really difficult one, but one of the things that that helped me really grasp that and understand that was just sitting with people when I couldn't move very much. You know, I've I've had some of the best conversations um, sitting down at a table across from a good friend at a coffee house or sitting on a couch while, you know, nursing one of my kids and realizing that some of the most powerful connections are made face to face with real people who love you. And so um, I want to encourage you when you are in a season of injury um, or body changes, whether that is because you've had a baby or you're getting older and you've noticed that there's body changes that you can't change, it's so important that you are always surrounding yourself with people who love you, people who care about you. And on the flip side of that, that you're always putting yourself in situations where you can serve others. Because I think there are stages in our life where we have to come to grips and understand that the things that we do in our life and the way that we affect um, or leave that imprint on other people it has a lot to do with who we are as a person and not so much what we look like. Now, I, I want to say this with the, with the greatest sensitivity too, because um, on, on a very personal level, I always want to be injury free. I want to look my best and I want to feel strong. I mean, those things are important to me. And I think that's something that we can all collectively agree. That's, that's something we're, we're working toward. We want to feel good in our bodies. And the reality is that we have a unique makeup about our bodies and we all look different. We all age differently. When we get pregnant, we put on weight differently. Uh, we get injured.
measured it at different seasons. When we understand that it is just a part of life and that it's it's normal, um, it does help us maybe receive that a little bit better. Give grace to yourself. Embrace all those seasons because you can still find good in those seasons. There are still so many things to be grateful for. Yes, even when you have an injury. I remember being in a boot. It was well over a decade ago, but I remember being in a boot and being so frustrated that I couldn't get out on the trails. But one thing that I committed myself to doing was doing all the things that I never had time to do or said that I was going to do or the hobbies that I was interested in. I was going to tackle all those things um, while I couldn't run, while I couldn't get on the trail. I also, man, I went out to lunch with so many more people than I usually did and connected with more friends than I, than I usually did, which that showed me a lot about myself too. And knowing like, wow, this is an area I can grow in. I need to make more time to do this because people fill me up and If I understand that injury is a part of being a human, my body changes um, is a part of being a human. I also um, get to choose how I react to those things. Embrace them, have grace on yourself, and know that you can always do the best with what you have, with whatever season you are in. And we can choose to still find joy in gratitude, both when we're injured and when we're in those, those body changing seasons. And the choice really is up to us. And you'd never know too, how you're going to relate or encourage someone else who's also experiencing that. And I think that's powerful. We're, there's always someone in our friend group or in our community that's struggling with injury or body changes. And I think that um, we can be a friend, we can be a guide, we can be an encouragement say, Hey, I've been there before. It doesn't last forever. It's going to get better. It is going to change. And I'm right here next to you. The next question is, uh, and I've, I've got two questions left. So we'll be wrapping this up pretty soon. But the next question says feelings and thoughts surrounding your first ultra. So this person wrote in because they were planning for uh, their first ultra. They sound like there was a lot of, um, uh, exciting anxiety and all the nerves and, um, all the anticipation that goes with it and wanting to kind of get a hold on how to deal with all that, you know, in a, in a good balanced way. So I remember, and I'll always remember for the rest of my life, uh, American river 50, that was my first ultra. I, I remember the training for it so very well. I remember the very first time I ran past the marathon distance. It was in a storm in Irvine, California. I ran on the mountains to sea trail. It's a, it's a really popular bike path. Um, I didn't run on trails cause I was still um, terrified of running on trails at this point. So I ran and all on road. I remember stopping and buying um, Oreos and a Snicker bar at a gas station because that's what De- Dean Carnaz's style was back then. I thought that's what it meant when you ran ultras, you ate a lot of sugar. <laughs> he doesn't do that anymore, but uh, really funny. Um, but I remember the sun coming out at the end and running those last like three or four miles in the sunshine and absolutely celebrating. I had run 31 miles. Um, and the storm was pretty horrific. We had sideways rain. There were all these alerts on TV before I left of, um, there was hail, um, pretty gnarly wind. And I remember telling myself, we'll all be ready if race day uh, has weather like this too. But so I, I remember everything about the lead up, um, to that ultra and really feeling the same way that I, that I felt going into Cocodona. I don't know what this distance is going to feel like. I don't know how my body is going to be. Um, I had some nerves, but like good nerves, like, like I was, I wanted to be as prepared as possible. So I was, I was just scouring over all of my lists and my gear and everything wanting to be the best that I could be for this first 50 mile race. And, you know, doing the same thing for Cocodona 250. I mean, I had like five pages of notes uh, just for, surrounding gear and nutrition. And I think that these are all really good and powerful feelings. And so if you are thinking about doing an ultra, you're preparing for your first ultra, know that everything you're feeling is totally normal because I feel like this happens when, uh, when we start a new school or we start a new job or we start dating someone new, you have all those exciting new feelings of, you don't know what to expect. You're about to go on this adventure. There's going to be a lot of unknowns. Yes, there is in an ultra 
One thing I like to encourage for the new runners is to genuinely take in every step, take in that expo, uh, that day before when you're picking up your bib, look through that race bag, look at everything that's been given to you, do your best to, to talk to volunteers, meet the other racers. The ultra running community is historically known for being incredibly friendly. You will make friends if you put yourself out there on race morning, breathe, eat your breakfast get to that start line, say hello to the people about you and know that you are about to embark on a really cool adventure. And this adventure is not only about how fast you can run the distance. There's a lot of different variables that you're going to be tested in. Um, how well that you can stomach your nutrition how well you know about what nutrition you should be taking in and electrolytes and how much and at what rate and what works for you and what doesn't. But you're going to have to learn how to operate on a trail. You know, how are you going to tackle those climbs? Uh, if it's a rocky or rooted trail, how are you going to traverse that terrain? How are you going to descend? Uh, if the weather changes, how are you going to respond to that? Are you prepared? Do you have the right gear? Do you have drop bags? Do you have a crew? Is there a pacer involved? Really the ongoing choices and decisions that you make in an ultra, those alone can exhaust you mentally, which is why you see a lot of uh, runners. They might bonk even in the last uh, 10 miles or so because they're making all these decisions that sometimes they forget how much they've eaten or if they've eaten enough, but there's a lot going on and you're also following markers, making sure you're staying on course. The goal on your first ultra is get to that finish line. And I love to encourage new runners in this because it really is about the journey. When you first set out, just like a little kid who's just first learning to walk, you're really learning about the movement. You're learning how to balance yourself. You're learning about coordination. You're learning how to move forward. And I think that anything that you do that's new in life should be taken with the same grace and patience. There is races every single weekend all over the world that you can do. And if you're looking to race really hard or set a PR or get on the podium, I don't know where you are in your journey, but regardless, even if you want to do this competitively, I really think using that first ultra to be a student, listen to your body, learn all the things and really enjoy the journey will make for an incredible experience. And the second thing I like to encourage, uh, you know, the feelings and thoughts, you know, the thoughts I had, of course, were like, can I really go 50 miles? I believed I could. I'd never gone that far. But I think that's important for you. Keep hope and belief at the forefront of your mind every step of the way, even if things start to unravel. It's important that you believe and understand, especially when you take a look at some of these cutoff times, too. I mean, a lot of these um, races give very serious, generous cutoff time. So even if you're in a funk and you're sitting in an aid station for an hour, don't think that your race is over. Try until the very last step um, that you can take. Try all the way to that finish line. And I'll tell you what, after you finish that first ultra, do yourself a favor and write down what you learned. You know, I'm a big believer in journals. Um, I love pen to paper. I know some of you like to use the notes on your phone or you like to type it up, but writing down, I've got tons of journals. I love to write down, okay, what did I learn? What are the takeaways? What could I do better? What was so great? What did I think of the terrain? You know, write all the details down because that information is going to be like gold to you. And you're going to begin to build on top of that. You're just going to keep getting better and better and better. So for the person who wrote this in, I hope you have a wonderful experience. Get to that finish line. But most of all, enjoy the journey, learn all the things and grow stronger because I promise that you will be a stronger version of yourself than when you started. The last one, and we're going to wrap up with this one. When emotions begin to overwhelm, and you feel like just giving into them, what mechanisms do you use to control them, own them, and have them fuel the fire? Really, really powerful um, question that I wanted to end on because I want to actually ask you this. So again, I'm acknowledging that you are, um, you know, you got me in, in your ears right now, but I want to make sure that this podcast has been worthwhile to you. 
And I want to ask you this question. When, when you feel like you're just overwhelmed and it could be in everyday life, you're overwhelmed with your kids. <laughs> I know how busy it gets. Especially if you have really, really little ones, um, you're overwhelmed at work that boss that won't stop nagging or just the deadlines that keep piling up. And maybe you're overwhelmed with just setbacks in your life. We can also say, Hey, what happens when you feel overwhelmed and those really powerful feelings come in in a race and it doesn't matter what distance the race is where we, a 5k, we could be talking about a, an Ironman. We could be talking about a marathon. We could talk about a hundred miler. When those emotions begin to overwhelm you and you feel like giving into them, what do you do to control them? What do you do in response to those? See, here's the thing. In life, we seldom pause and ask ourselves, is there a pattern here? If you could take 10 minutes after this podcast and think about maybe some significant events in your life or some significant setbacks or when you have felt overwhelmed, is there a pattern with how you respond to those things, whether it's in race or in life? And your pattern, it could be great. It could be not so great. It could be something that we could improve upon. It could be something that is really tearing you down. But it isn't until you look back and you peel back those layers and you examine it that you're going to learn about yourself or that you're going to be able to now finally implement a positive change. And that's really what it's about. When it comes to the mental game, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to remember who you are and where you came from and how you operate and why it is that you do. You have to be honest with how you genuinely talk about yourself, not what you put on social media, but how do you genuinely talk about about yourself, how you genuinely view yourself. And when the world overwhelms you and you just feel like, I just don't want to do this anymore because I don't think I'm capable or it's too much work or it's wearing me down. Um, I'm just overwhelmed and I'm, I'm going to, I'm throwing the towel in. What are the mechanisms that you can use to overcome that? So I'm going to share just a couple things that I do because as I said at the beginning of these questions, I have been in many overwhelming situations, both on the trail and racing and in life. And emotions are feelings and feelings are fleeting. Feelings do not stay. I mean, feelings change from hour to hour, from week to week, year to year. I mean, think about how you felt about your um, Hollywood crush when you were eight years old or whatever superstar, or, or maybe that kid in your class that you had a big crush on, do you still have those feelings? No, your feelings change. And you get to choose those feelings. You get to choose how you interact with those feelings. So one of the most powerful things that I do is I tell myself, don't think, just go. Because sometimes, and many times in my life, I have been so overwhelmed by feelings that I react to those feelings, and then I end up regretting it. I do something or I say something that I regret or I give in too easily. And then I think, man, if I wasn't feeling that way, or if I didn't focus so much on the feelings, I probably wouldn't have done that. And so you're, you focusing on how you feel instead of what you want or what is true can actually be very damaging. Now, this isn't to say that how you feel isn't important. We have feelings for a reason. And I would never trade the feelings, um, many wonderful, amazing feelings that I've had in my life. When I think of the first time that Mackenzie or Isaiah was set in my arms, I will remember those feelings for the rest of my life, the, 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 some of the greatest feelings of my life, right? So those emotions and feelings, they're a part of who we are as humans. But when it comes to very difficult, challenging, tough situations, one way to crawl out from being paralyzed by things that overwhelm us is to focus on what is true and the goal that we want to achieve within that situation. And it, I'm not talking about big um, pie in the sky type goals. I'm just talking about where is it? How do you want this to end? How do you want this to turn out in your favor? What can we do? in order to make that happen as best we can. And yes, sometimes we just can't change the situation, but we can change how we receive 
what is going on. We can we can accept um, words or critics or situations, or we we can reject. And I think that if you understand that you are in control, you are uh, you have the power over your emotions, over your feelings then it puts you in a place of control, even in the most rotten situations. And so when you understand that, yeah, this really stinks, but you know what? I have the power and I'm not going to focus on all the feelings that are associated with this because the feelings are not helping me move forward. The feelings are not actually helping the situation um, become better. But what I am going to focus on are my actions. What I am going to focus on are what I'm doing in this moment to either get out of what I'm feeling or how to move forward. I want you to take a minute and and think about this after this podcast is done, because I really hope that um, when you finish me, you feel not only encouraged, but you're gonna be able to implement some of these things into your life and that you understand that regardless of what anyone has told you about not being capable or maybe what you tell yourself about not being strong enough or things aren't just gonna, things aren't going to change or I can't, or this is too hard or I'm, this season is lasting too long. I want to be that voice in your head that says you can and you are capable and you are strong enough, and you actually don't know what is down the road for you. If we had the opportunity to see into the future, I think, yes, a lot of us would be living our lives differently, but none of us get that opportunity. None of us know how the story ends before we get there, but you have to take the step forward in order to find out. Go write an amazing story. No one gets to do that for you. No one can live your life for you. Everything that makes you unique and wonderful is something that you should acknowledge on a daily basis. I'm looking forward to following your story, to hearing your story. It's unique. It's strong. And so are you. Keep choosing strong, my friends. Thanks again for listening.